We've been singing and praising the Lord for the greatness of His grace, His work in our lives, and all this in anticipation of there's a time coming when He will return to this earth and He'll come in power and great glory and establish a kingdom that shall never end. God in His grace has given us His Word. And as His Word was being completed, God graciously gave a final word of revelation to his servant John. Think about it. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, died under persecution in around 68 AD. Then over 25 years later, God gave a final word of revelation to the aged disciple John as he was suffering in exile on the island of Patmos. It's the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The final word from God to his people. So if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, we are in chapter 8. Chapter 8 of the book of Revelation. Uh, The the Bible simply is about the character of God and the condition of man. God is a holy and righteous God, and he must deal with sin. Man is in the condition of sinfulness, and in his sin he is in a state of rebellion against God. And the Bible is about a holy God dealing with sinful man. And God is a God of holiness, of righteousness, of justice, but he's a God of mercy, love, and kindness. So we see both running through the scripture. And God will bring to ultimate conclusion his dealing with mankind, both by manifesting his holiness and righteousness in judging sinful humanity, and in saving and rescuing those who have responded to his love and experienced his grace in cleansing them and making them new. That's what the message of Jesus Christ is all about. Uh, We are lost and without hope in the world. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are the enemies of God. We are in rebellion against him. But God in love and mercy sent his son to pay the penalty for our sin so that we might have life in him. Now what God is doing in the book of Revelation is sending a message to his people, the church, uh, individual local churches, seven particularly selected out in chapters two and three. And he's telling them how it all will now end. Old Testament prophets talked about this. Jesus talked about it during his earthly ministry. But now God is going to lay out in greater detail and in greater and more clear order how things will end. And beginning with chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, we have the unfolding of events that start seven years before Christ returns to earth. I'm giving you a break. I'm not putting the chart up again this morning. But if you've been here, you probably have it impressed on the back of your forehead. Uh, The 70th week of Daniel, God's concluding events in dealing in judgment on an unbelieving world and bringing his people Israel finally to their knees where they recognize that indeed Jesus of Nazareth, the one they crucified on the cross, is their Messiah, is their Savior. And then in chapter 19, Christ will return to earth in power and great glory. And we will have a kingdom established We have events then related to that in chapters 20 and 21 and 22. 
in there we will have the last judgment of Scripture, the great white throne at the end of chapter 20. The book of Revelation unfolds in a series of judgments. Uh, In chapters 4 and 5, we had a scene set in heaven. And in chapter 5, we saw a scroll sealed with seven seals. And there was no one in heaven or on earth that was qualified to open the seals, to unfold what was in that scroll. But there was one, uh, the Lamb of God. He's called the Lamb of God because he's the one, Jesus Christ, who was sacrificed to provide salvation for sinners so that there could be an eternal kingdom of glory established, populated by the redeemed. Without the work of Christ, we could have all the judgments recorded, but it would end in judgment with no salvation. So that seven-sealed scroll unfolds now the finality of God's program in dealing with sin and establishing an eternal kingdom. Seven seals. Now, those seven seals contain everything right on through, uh, basically chapter 22, for the words of conclusion. Uh, The bulk of it is about the judgments. Now, out of the seventh seal will come the rest of the book. I say that because you'll note chapter 8 of Revelation, verse 1, began. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal. Now this scroll only has seven seals. So everything from chapter 8, verse 1, through the rest of the book, chapter 22, is contained within this seventh seal. Christ was the only one qualified, and he is the one who has opened each of the seals, right down to this last, the seventh. The lamb broke the seventh seal. He is the one, he's the only one qualified. Now the judgments that come out of the seventh seal and the culmination with uh, the new heavens and the new earth all come out of the seventh seal. Uh, it's important, even the new heavens and new earth, because that's a result of his redemptive work. Um, so we have a series of judgments that move us through this seven-year period. Um, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. But keep in mind, out of the seventh seal come seven trumpets. Out of the seventh trumpet will come seven bowls. Then will come the kingdom. We can just summarize it that way. So, subset. So, this each, when each seal was broken, there was judgments that came out of each seal. So you break a seal and uh, a judgment comes. Now, with the seventh seal, out of that's going to come eight trumpets, uh, seven trumpets, uh, starting in chapter eight. When a trumpet is sounded, a judgment will come. But Christ doesn't sound the judgments. He opens the seventh seal. And out of that seventh seal will come seven trumpet judgments. Every time a trumpet is sounded, one after another, a judgment will come upon the earth. When the seventh trumpet is sounded, out of that seventh trumpet will come seven bowl judgments. Again, angels sound the trumpets, angels turn over the bowls. Every time a bowl is turned over on the earth in the picture, a judgment comes on the earth. So what we're doing is moving through this seven-year period called the 70th week of Daniel um, to the climax with the return of Christ. Uh, These judgments get progressively more severe. The seven seals, then the seven trumpets, they're more severe. The seven bowls are the worst. 
It brings us to chapter 19, the return of Christ, Armageddon, and so on. So uh, this matter of God's judgment, dealing with wrath, there's been preparation for it throughout the Old Testament. The greatest example was the judgment of the flood in the days of Noah. Gave a picture of when God's wrath is poured out in judgment, it is devastating. But these final judgments have more mercy in them than the flood did. The flood destroyed all humanity except for Moses and his immediate family. In these judgments in the tribulation, they're going to be tremendous, but there will be a number of people saved, including, by and large, the nation Israel. So it's like the judgment in the days of Noah. It'll encompass the entire world and bring judgments beyond what we can really imagine. But it's not as complete as it was in the days of Noah because when all said and done, there will be the nation Israel and nations of the earth that have survived. But mankind the Bible says, will be scarcer than pure gold. So we're talking billions of people dying under the judgments of God. And even the immediate judgments we see, we've had hurricanes, earthquakes. They are reminders. We want to be careful. As I've mentioned to you before, we want to be careful about saying, well, this is a judgment because of this particular sin of this country. I don't think we can say that. But remember, God asked the rhetorical question. Does calamity happen to a city and I have not done it? No. So we are careful. We're not apologizing for God. In fact, in talking about these, they provide an opening for us. You know, the Bible says these are just indications of what is going to come upon the world in a greater way. These are brought about by sin. The result of man being in sin and rebellion against God, judgment comes upon the world. Sometimes in limited ways, sometimes in greater ways. Come back to the book of Genesis chapter 15. I try to spend a lot of time in introductions, then I don't have to work so hard on new material. I want us to be clear of the context. People have the idea that God is up there and he wouldn't want anything, quote, bad happening. And uh, don't want to think God would cause the kind of destruction that encompasses men, women, and children. But God is serious about sin. It is a serious thing. More serious, the most serious thing is opposition to God, that man would stand in opposition to him. So God is giving a promise to Abraham and his descendants in chapter 15. And I just want to pick up the end of verse 13 there. Or in verse 13, God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. That's when... Abraham's descendants will go down into Egypt for 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. Afterward, they will come out with many possessions. And for you, Abram, you're not going to see this. You'll die, be buried. Uh, but in the fourth generation, verse 16, so after 400 years, so God is using a generation of 100 years at this point, they will return. Now note this. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So you see what happens here. We had the flood of Noah, and the iniquity of the world was so great, Genesis 6 says, that God brought judgment on the whole creation, all the world. But here you have a more limited context. 
the land of Canaan. God had promised it to the Israelites. For the Israelites to have it, he will have to remove the Canaanites. But he says it's not time for that. The iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So it's going to take 400 years for the people of the land of Canaan to continue in their sinful rebellion against the living God. Then God says, judgment. You know what happens when God sends the people of Israel into the land? You can read the book of Joshua. God's instructions, you would destroy every man, every woman, every child. They are to die. So there you see something of God's judgment in a limited scope in this particular area. But through the Old Testament, all of God's judgments become something of an his indication of his anger toward sin. A reminder, he is a God of righteousness who deals with sin. Again, be careful about saying, oh, well, because of this particular sin, God being judge, bringing judgment on America, and if we stop that sin, then he would withhold judgment. We never stop sin. It is persistent. It is the heart that is in rebellion against him. It manifests itself in more clear ways, more openly, more defiantly. But we are moving toward Ultimate judgment. Come over to the New Testament and stop at the book of Romans, if you would. We'll stop. Uh, Romans chapter 1 draws a contrast to what's going on. We're really going to chapter 2, but stop at chapter 1, verse 16 to 18, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For note verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is being revealed. Present participle is being revealed from faith to faith that is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. See the contrast. God in grace is revealing the provision of his righteousness in Jesus Christ. That's why it is good news. The gospel. Um, there is hope. There is salvation. God has intervened to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. But this gospel also reveals the wrath of God. There is no toleration for sin. And those who do not avail themselves of the provision of what God has done in Christ are under the wrath of God. And unless they turn to Christ and place their faith in him, they will bear the full brunt of that. We'll get to that in Revelation 14 when God says the smoke of their torment in hell rises up before him into the ages of the ages, eternally. We'll see the appointment to that in Revelation 20 at the great white throne. You'll note these men suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They're at their very heart. Man knows his guilt and accountability, but he is defiant toward God. He lists all the manifestation of sin, and God's judgment on man is to turn him over to his sin. You continue to defy me, rebel against me. So, verse 24, God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity. It doesn't say he caused them to commit impurity. He turned them over. Allowing them to pursue their own defiant, sinful rebellion. Then down in verse 26, he repeated, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. We look around and say, what is going on in the world? We see something of the more evident manifestation of God's wrath being poured out on a world that has continued. It becomes more open and defiant in its rebellion. 
And God's judgment is pursue your sin. Uh, then again, he says it in verse 28. They did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gave them over to a depraved mind. And all kind of sinful activity comes out of that. It grows. What is happening in the world today? Can you believe the open, arrogant defiance of God? Well, they know, verse 32, the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but give hearty approval to those who do them. They applaud those who become openly speak of their sin. They are people to be honored. Come to tell them the truth of God, the seriousness of their sin, the graciousness of God, graciousness of God in providing a savior, and it's quickly shut down. That's not appropriate. Um, they know they were created in the image of God. That image has been defiled and marred by sin, but it hasn't ceased to exist. Um, so you come down to chapter 2, verse 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Why hasn't God intervened and brought destruction? Why does God let this go on? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. These are days of salvation. Another day for a person to hear that God loved the world and gave his son and be convicted and turn from that sin and place their faith in Christ. But you continue to say no to that. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. No, make no mistake. No one gets away, so to speak, with anything. No one escapes judgment because judgment is delayed. That may happen in the human realm. It does not happen when you're dealing with the living God. So God delays judgment, giving men and women an opportunity to place their faith in Christ and be delivered from judgment. When they don't, they are just storing up and adding. It's like the Amorites that we read in Genesis 15. Their sin wasn't yet ripe. The world is going and ripening for judgment when we come to uh, the events of Revelation 6 and following now the fruit is really ripe, culminating with the final judgment that Christ will bring. So that's what we see going on in the world when we come to Revelation, come to chapter 8. Uh, mind you of this because people have in their mind an idea that God, all he wants to do is good things, and that's all he'll do. So, you know... And even the church begins to minimize the seriousness of sin and weaken their view of sin. And soon we have nothing to say to a world that denies what they know. They are sinners and guilty. But we come to go along with them as though it's not so serious. It could not be any more serious it's fatal, eternally fatal, the disease of sin. That's why only God's Son could come. That's why all heaven rejoiced, remember, in chapter 5? That the Lamb, He's been the sacrifice. He can open the scroll. It brings judgment. But the ultimate end of it will be redemption, not for everyone. For some, they will end where their sin takes them, in an eternal hell. But by the grace of God, there's redemption. All right, the Lamb broke the seventh seal. Out of that seventh seal, we're ready to have seven angels holding trumpets, and they're going to blow a trumpet. And every time an angel blows a trumpet, 
judgments poured out on the world. And uh, the first four judgments are serious. The last three of the trumpet judgments move it to a different level. And you begin to think, is there anything left to the world? And you appreciate when the Old Testament uh, uh, prophet is used by God to say, I'll make mortal man more scarce than gold. Pure gold. Jesus said if he didn't intervene at the end of seven years, there wouldn't be a person left alive on the face of the earth. This is where we're going. All right. So the angels are ready. But first, the prayers of the saints come up before the throne of God. We've already looked at this section. God answers the prayers of his people on his time schedule. Now he is ready to answer the prayers. We saw something of the martyrs uh, back in chapter 6 when they asked, how long would God delay bringing judgment on those who are killing his people? And we looked back in Luke where Christ told the parable that God will respond to the prayers of his people who ask for God to avenge their death. So now God is pouring out wrath on the earth. And so the prayers ascend to the Father and a censer filled with the coals from the fire of the brazen altar as it would have been thrown to the earth. The seven angels, verse 6, then who had the seven trumpets sound. We looked at the first trumpet just to get ourselves started. And when that trumpet sounds, hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown to the earth. The impact of that. A third of the trees were burned up. A third of the earth. The green grass is burned up. It's a devastating judgment. Uh, you'll note, remember, we said 12 times they're going to say a third, a third, a third. There is mercy here. Um, that means two-thirds of the earth are not destroyed in these judgments. But the scope of it, when you think of it, by the time we won't get there in this study, uh, before we're done the trumpets, We'll be told under one of the trumpets, a third of the earth's population dies. Well, we already saw back under the fourth seal in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 6 that a quarter of the earth's population died. And then you add into that all the people dying in these other judgments. People were dying uh, on a scale. We're already into the billions. And we haven't gotten to the worst yet. So here a third of the earth is burned up and the trees and uh, the green grass is burned. Uh, what a devastating judgment um, that's going to bring. We noted uh, the connection of that with the uh, judgment in Egypt. Some of these judgments as we've talked about are previewed, if you will, on the judgments God poured out on Egypt when he was preparing to have Pharaoh let his enslaved people go. Uh, so there again, you get a preview, something of judgment, and God is behind it. Uh, in Exodus 9, we don't, won't go back there again, but a third of the earth's vegetation was destroyed by hair and hail and uh, a fire. Uh, in the fourth plague, uh, that hail and fire was poured out on Egypt. And so you had that destruction by hail and fire. And everything that didn't heed what God had said through Moses, all the people that weren't in safe hiding and hadn't taken their animals in, they all died under that too. So it doesn't say here that a third of the people died, but when this hail and fire is poured out from heaven, along with the blood, a lot of people are going to die. Um, you know, just pour it out there uh, on the earth. So a devastating judgments and the consequences of that. Um, 
And there's a parallel in Egypt. Again, we talked about that, but remind you, God was bringing judgment on Egypt so he might ultimately deliver his people and they would be able to take possession of the land he promised. Now we're getting ready for the ultimate realization. The judgment on the unbelieving world, and we'll see the devastating persecution of Israel as the world attempts to annihilate the Jews as we move further in chapter 12 and 13 of Revelation particularly. But God is what? Preparing Israel. And he will bring deliverance to them. And they ultimately, um, those that survive and come through, will be delivered to take possession of the land um, and be the key people in the kingdom that the Jewish Messiah will establish. So let's look at the second trumpet. The second angel sounded. Something like a great mountain burning with fire. Now, he doesn't say it's a great mountain burning with fire. But the only way John can describe it is it looks like a mountain on fire descending. They say about these judgments, you know, they're all miraculous. Some, you know, are more directly caused by God. Some God is using, like in Egypt, when the locust plague come, it said he had a great east wind come and blow the locust in, then a great west wind came and blew them out. Well, it was using forces, but it was direct involvement of him in using the wind, in using the locust. Um, if you read some of uh, scientists who are Bible believers, they'll sometimes give explanations of the way God could be using natural things. The point here is, it's clear God is doing it. And you'll see how many of these come down from heaven indicating, and the unbelievers in the world know what's happening. Uh, we loaded uh, at the end of chapter 6, uh, even the great mighty men of the earth hide us from the wrath uh, of God who sits on the throne and of the Lamb. Later in Revelation, we've jumped ahead and looked in our previous studies, people uh, curse God for their suffering. So there's a recognition of God's hand in this. That doesn't mean men will bow before him any more than Pharaoh did under the constant plagues in Egypt. He couldn't account for it. It had to be from God. It had to be supernatural. But he hardened his heart. Uh, there's no explanation rationally for sin. It makes no sense. It's self-destructive. But yet we pursue it to shows how it enslaves us. So, something like a great mountain burning with fires thrown into the sea. Supernatural result of this, God does this in a visible way so it can be seen. A third of the sea became blood. Uh, that's similar to the plague in Egypt when God turned the waters to blood. Here you have a third of the oceans turned to blood. I mean, a third of life in the sea dies. A third of the ships are destroyed. Um, one commentator did a study. It goes back to 1981. says there were almost 25,000 ocean-going merchant ships registered. Well, if a third of them are destroyed, there's eight, over 8,000 ships destroyed there. And the life that goes with that. I mean, and then what? How much of the food source comes? Now, as I mentioned, there's different views and commentators. Much of the book of Revelation is clear and understandable. We just take it at face value. That doesn't mean we understand every detail and how it will be worked out. In other words, a question uh, comes up. Does this third of the earth... Is it limited to God doing it in one particular part of the world, the earth? Or is it spread evenly over everything? Um, good men hold different views, um, and I'm not sure which it is. Uh, it could be either. I don't know. Maybe there's variation. I know it will impact a third of the oceans. 
Is that just in this part of the world? Does God choose to? I don't know. Uh, under these judgments, it could go either way. I shared with you back in uh, chapter 6, verse 8, where a fourth of the earth is killed. Well, what would it be? And I mentioned one uh, prophetic writer said, well, maybe that's North and South America, which would be about a fourth of the earth. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's where the United States goes. They'll say, how does the United States fit in prophecy? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's wiped out. I don't know. Uh, so in these judgments, just exactly how they're spread out, whether much of it takes place under a third in this part of the world and another in this part of whether God is, we know normal life is going on in a lot of places. You read this and say, well, there couldn't be anybody living a normal life. But you are. I watched a little bit of the news on uh, what happened in Puerto Rico while I ate dinner. I'm sorry for those people. If I skip dinner, it doesn't help. I'm not saying we don't send help down and all, but what goes on in other parts of the world, here you are, comfortable, you had enjoyed your house. There are people in Houston who can't go back into their homes. They're covered with mold. Well, that's too bad. And I hope we can do something to help them. Um, but we go on. I say that because Jesus said they'll be marrying and giving in marriage and much of that life will be going on even as it did in the days of Noah until destruction overtook them. And so this will be uh, going on and uh, maybe that will be. If one third of the earth gets destroyed and it's over in Asia or someplace that doesn't direct and affect me, we go on. Pretty much. All right. So at any rate, a third of the oceans destroyed. Uh, a lot of people are going to die. A lot of the food source for a lot of people would come out of this. The consequences are great. The next angel takes his trumpet. Third angel. And there's a star. So you see another heavenly body. A meteorite, asteroid, who knows? Is it maybe something God cast down from heaven? Obviously, it's not a normal meteorite or something because it has a name, wormwood. It's something that is poisonous. In the Old Testament, uh, something would be bitter, poisonous. You can't drink it, and that's clear here. A third of the waters became wormwood. Many men died from the waters because they were made bitter, undrinkable. They're poisonous. Now think about that. You know, you can uh, see on TV, they'll advertise because of coming disasters, you might want to buy a special kind of food. They say it'll last, I don't know, 25 years. So you'll have food to eat. I don't know if you can store 25 years worth of water to get you through. The problem here, one third of the fresh water is destroyed. Now, what do you do? I mean, how do you get to it? Where do you get? Well, we ship water in. We're finding out how difficult that is in just a little portion of the world. How do you get what they need there when so much of it's destroyed? Hey, we can't even communicate. We don't even know what the situation is. Um, and there's greater disaster. A dam may break, but we can't get word to anybody there because there's no communication able to go on. So those 70,000 people don't know the dam's going to break and flood them all out, and we can't tell them. I mean, the world quickly gets better. Here you have one-third of the world now without fresh water. Um, and a third of the ocean's been destroyed. Um, things are happening at a catastrophic uh, level. Um, come back to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. And while you're coming to Exodus 15, we're not going to Exodus 7, but in one of the plagues in Egypt, fresh water was destroyed, turned to blood. Um, so here... Exodus 15, you have a 
situation where Israel's out in the wilderness, Exodus 15, 22, they have left Egypt. Moses led Israel, verse 22 of Exodus 15, uh, from the Red Sea, went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness, found no water. They came to Marah. They could not drink the waters of Marah. They were bitter. Um, that's why they name it Marah, bitterness. So you remember, it's like the wormwood, bitterness. It's undrinkable. Um, God performs a miracle through Moses to make the bitter waters drinkable. Now we have the reverse of that miracle. For a third of the earth, the drinkable waters are going to be made undrinkable. Poison. You can't drink it. Doesn't mean people won't because it's like somebody floating in a raft on the ocean and, you know, you can't drink the salt water, but finally they can't help themselves, you know, thirst. But when you drink it, you've just caused a greater problem. Uh, come over to Jeremiah chapter 9. We don't take as long. We can't look at all the allusions to the Old Testament. There are hundreds of them, as we've noted in the book of Revelation. But come to Jeremiah chapter 9. Uh, look at verse 13. The Lord said, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according it, have walked after the stubbornness of their heart, after the bales as their father taught them. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood, give them poisoned water to drink. The judgment that he would bring upon Israel. Some of these judgments had a foreview of that happened to them when nations come in and defeated them. But the ultimate fulfillment of these will carry us to where we are in Revelation. In chapter 23 of Jeremiah, he says a similar thing in verse 15. Thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, I am going to feed them wormwood, make them drink poisonous waters, for the prophets of Jeru from the prophets of Jerusalem, pollution has gone forth. There is a justice in the judgment. The vileness of man is now being given back to him. In his life and what he has said and all of that, you had poisonous speech. Now he poisons the water. So uh, the fitness of the judgment. Come back to Revelation 8. We're told, verse 11, many men died. I mention this because we have specific numbers with specific judgments. Under the seal, one seal, we saw a quarter of the earth die. In a future trumpet, we'll see a third of the earth. But don't think that's all. We have many people dying under the other judgments as well but some that have a particularly uh, devastating effect in causing death, we have a number associated, but there are people dying all over the place. How do you even handle this? You've got, we haven't gotten to the worst yet, and we have billions of people dead on the earth. I mean, that becomes its own health issue of uh, you cope. You can see the world is becoming overwhelmed. It's the grace of God that keeps it from complete destruction. All right, verse 12, you have the fourth angel sounded. A third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars were struck, so a third of them would be darkened. The day would not shine for a third of it, the night the same way. Now we have reduced light, and some again that uh, bring more scientific stuff in, talk about some of the devastation. What this do to the temperature uh, of the earth? We're worried about global warming. And you know, God, here he's going to reduce the light, reduce the heat from the sun. But then later we're going to find him scorching the earth by turning the temperature up with the sun so that men are cursing him because of the heat. 
You know, people are under, God is in control of everything. He is sovereign. It could be no more serious to be, than to be the enemy of the holy, almighty, all-powerful God. This is not a game. We like to draw this picture of what God is like. My God is like this. My God wouldn't do that. Let's come to the only true and living God. He's a God of infinite love. Well, then why would he do this? Because he's also a God of infinite holiness. Infinite anger. So he can provide for people an infinite salvation that will have no end. He can also provide them an infinite hell that will have no end. This, you know, we reduce God to be like us. And that's what he said uh, in the Old Testament. You thought I was like you. He's not like us in that sense. And so serious matter. Uh, these signs in the heavens. Um, there was a judgment on Egypt. Again, in Exodus chapter 10. Where God brought a darkness that could be felt. Um, over the land of Egypt. And no one did anything or went anywhere. I encourage you, if you haven't uh, recently, read the plagues in Egypt. Um, they give you a connection, um, and a foretaste of what happens here, a darkness that could be felt. Just think of a third of the light in day and night cut off. And the impact of that. Uh, come back, we'll go to a couple of verses. Isaiah chapter 13. This is as far as we'll get in the trumpets. But Isaiah 13, it's an example again. And again, they, all the judgments that happened in through Old Testament, they're all a preview and a foretaste. The judgments we see going on in the world today are a reminder of what God can do. It's a little foretaste. There's no hiding. Uh, escaping. Look at Isaiah 13, verse 6. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp. Every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. God wants to terrify you. Uh, we had, uh, watched one man rode out the hurricane. He said, I'd never do that again. That was a mistake. I thought I could do it. I had had other, I never. When God wants to bring down, you see people running in terror. He shakes the earth. People running and screaming and where do I go? Uh, what does he say here? They will be terrified. All hands will fall limp. Every man's heart will melt. They'll be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They'll be like a woman in labor. They'll look at one another in astonishment. Their flames, uh, faces of flame. I mean, you, you can, their terror. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Cruel, fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation. He will exterminate the, its sinners from it. The stars of heaven, their constellations, will not flash their light. The sun will be darkness when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud, the base, the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold. I mean... The anger of God is something to be feared. Verse 13, therefore I will make the heavens tremble. The earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. You, know, people wanna, you can talk about the love of God and it's wonderful. We sing of it. Uh, you know, it is beautiful. But rebellion against God is something awful. We cannot conceive. It will result in men and women spending an eternity in the fires of hell. We can't grasp that. We can't, we, 
we believe it because God says it. But to say something has no end, we'll be enjoying the glory of his presence forever. People, you'd think they'd be knocking on your door so you couldn't get any sleep. Tell me about that good news that will spare me from wrath to come. Tell me of the salvation God's provided so I can be cleansed and become his child. It's just not happening. Why? You, we go out and tell them they don't want to hear. God says the day comes. I withdraw my grace. I bring my judgment. Uh, and it is fierce. Um, come over to Joel 2. Isaiah is easier to find than Joel. God hid it. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. There it is. And we think of the book of Joel as the book of the day of the Lord. That's what it's about. So if you haven't read Joel lately, sit down and read through the book of Joel. You can read it briefly in one sitting. Short book. Um, Look at chapter 1, verse uh, 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Chapter 2 opens, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Um, there has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be again. Um, it is a day of judgment, destruction. Um, all right, come back to Revelation. So we conclude this. We've had the six seal judgments, then the seventh seal, which brings out the seven trumpets. We've seen the four trumpets and their devastation of the earth. Now we're ready to kick it up. Now it can get bad. So God is going to send an eagle to fly through the heavens there so all the earth can hear what this eagle announces. Whoa, whoa, whoa. For what is about yet to come. For the remaining three blasts of the trumpet. I mean, can it get any worse? And he doesn't just say, whoa. He just doesn't say, whoa, whoa. These, this is so going to be so bad. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The woes that are coming on the earth now are going to be of greater impact, more devastating than yet. And in those last three trumpets, out of the last of the trumpets is going to come the seven bowls, and they'll be like and on a level the world has never seen. And even when you think it could never get any worse than this, it's going to get worse. So we have had deaths in the billions, much of the earth destroyed. Now God says, I'm going to make it really bad. Uh, then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So we have a break here. Oh, what all of this? Here we are in the church. And my understanding is the church will be removed before this seven-year period. Well, what do we care? Some people think the book of Revelation is difficult, got a lot of symbols, and, you know, it's about the future, and I won't be here, and I'm happy with that. But come back to Revelation chapter 1 again. Read verse 3. Blessed is he who reads... Those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Heed, keep, te reo. Now respect now to live in light of these things 
And a reminder in God's grace at the end of verse 5, Christ is the one who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. But he is coming again to set up a kingdom, verse 7. That's what the book of Revelation is about. Come to the end of the book, chapter 22. Verse 6. And here we end with the servants of the Lord, those redeemed by his grace, reigning forever and ever in that eternal kingdom. Verse 6. He said to me, these words are faithful and true. And what God has done, the end of the verse, is sent to reveal the things which must soon take place. Behold, Christ says, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. The angel who serves God day and night says, I am a fellow servant with those who serve him on earth. Those, the end of verse 9, who heed the words of this book. Um, God expects us to know this. It, it didn't say, well, you know, it's so confusing, I don't intend you to understand. I intend you to pay attention to this. I intend this to be something that you keep. It shapes your behavior. It guides us. We understand. Peter talks about, we'll be in that in a later time, First, uh, Second Peter 3. People think, where's the Lord? Why has he come? Where's the judgment that's, uh, you know, you're always saying judgment is coming, judgment is coming. But the Lord is patient. Oh, what do you mean? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. We can tell people there's judgment coming. God says you are his enemy, but he invites you to be his friend, his child. God says you're on your way to destruction and an eternal hell, but he says I loved you enough to have my son intervene to pay the penalty for your sin. Turn from your sin. Place your faith in him. I'll cleanse you. I'll forgive you. I'll make you my child, the heir with my son of a coming kingdom. And people say, no. Well, they get what they deserve. They get what we all deserve. I don't want what I deserve. I want mercy. I know what I deserve. I deserve the judgment of God. I deserve to be punished for my sin. They are my, it's my sin. It's mercy, it's grace that Christ should take my sin, your sin, in his body on the cross, that we through faith in him might be identified with him and die to sin and live to righteousness. I can't understand why people aren't lined up for 10 miles down the road trying to get in and hear the message. Why your family don't want to hear it? It reveals how stubborn we are, how great the grace of God is, because you're a bunch of stubborn people I'm looking at. But God saved you. And you're hearing it from a stubborn preacher that God saved. It's mercy. So we want to live in light of this, be ready to tell people there is hope, there is life, there is light and darkness, there is a Savior. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the riches of your grace. We look at the revelation you've given and the destiny of this world and the people in it and it is awesome, it is frightening, it is fearful. And yet, Lord, in the midst of it, you graciously invite people to salvation, a free gift. You've paid it all. Lord, may we as your children not be lax with these truths. May they grip our hearts. May we keep them. May we not forget. May we live in light of them. May we be lights in the darkness. May we be bold in telling others the truth of righteousness provided in Christ and in no one else, in no place else. 
Thank you for your love. Thank you for your provision. In Christ's name, amen.